here with Jim Walker. Thanks so much for doing this with me today. Glad to be here. What is the difference between attending a music conservatory and a university? The basic difference is that uh, most conservatories are heavily weighted towards the music and performance. Academics are an important component, but not a priority. The university, I think it's almost 50-50. Even though USC is, we're the conservatory wing of the Thornton School of the University of Southern California, academics are definitely a heavier load here than they are at Colbert. So you started doing jazz improv in like junior high or high school, is that right? I called myself a high school flute jazz hacker. Mm -hmm. uh, I started fiddling around probably eighth or ninth grade. Okay. And by the time I was in the 10th grade, my dad, who was a really good jazz player, who used to do club dates, uh, started taking me along to his dance jobs. Awesome. And so I would fiddle around and generally kind of improvise some harmonies to his melodies of the standards. Right. And some improvisation, but generally just kind of in the background. And they would occasionally, I would be given a solo mm -hmm. and it wasn't necessarily very good, but it was it was a good training ground for me. So later on you started playing with Free Flight and it was when you were in LA Phil, is that right? Yeah, but there's a big gap in there I should tell you about because I think it happened to a lot of people in my generation mm -hmm. where we grew up in American in the band culture of America, which did include in those days they called it stage band, and especially with my dad's influence. So I did a lot of kind of jazz in high school. I played lead alto in the jazz band. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to college at the University of Louisville, for the first year, I also played sax and did oh, wow. a little flute improv. But then I realized I actually wasn't very good at it. <laughs> and in fact, playing the saxophone was really starting to mess with my flute embouchure. Mm -hmm. So around the age of 20, I pretty much put away any ambition to be a jazz player because I, I, I came to grips with the fact that I wasn't good. I also gave up doubling the clarinet and sax because I wasn't willing to practice those instruments. So it would be hard to practice all those and be really good. And at that's everything. why the woodwind doublers who you've heard of who are so amazing, they keep all of those instruments up. And I simply didn't have that dream. Right. So when, when you did go to play with free flight, uh, did you, how did you teach yourself to improv so and to do jazz? Basically what happened was that I took that hiatus pretty much through the army until I was 25, then I was in the Pittsburgh Symphony until I was 33. I came to LA when I was 33, and that was a big change for me. I got a new job, I got a divorce. I basically, at that point, went back to my high school roots that were unfulfilled, which was jazz. And the coincidence which made it possible for me was Jamie Abersold had created his improvisation play-along books and guide, and I was just totally taken with that. Because what happened with me as a high schooler and an early college improviser, the, the language of improvisation hadn't really been codified so that classical players or even would-be jazz players could actually see, oh, here are some scales that will work with some of these chords. Mm -hmm. And if you practice these passages or these licks, you'll start to develop a little bit of a vocabulary so that your improvisation won't just be ideas that never really come to fruition. Right. So as uh, in my first, actually first two years of the LA Philharmonic, I would play a concert, I would go to a jazz club, then I would go home, I was single in those days, I would go home, and practice improv till two or three in the morning. Wow. So I was secretly in the improvisation closet trying to do what I maybe should have done as a high school or a college kid. Wow, and then you were you were obviously successful at doing that, and everything went well with free flight, and you're still doing that. Yeah, uh, it was pretty. It was if I look back, it was probably a dream that I wouldn't really talk about a lot as a high schooler. But I do remember uh, upon graduation, my senior book, my best friend wrote in there, "I hope I can buy a Jimmy Walker album someday," and. In those days, I was probably going to have been some sort of jazz or doubler. So that's what that implied. And I remember thinking, oh God, what, a, what an amazing dream that would be, right. but I don't think it's gonna happen. So, you know, who knows? I think what happened 
When I first came to L.A., uh, I was so excited to be playing principal flute and so excited on the side to be getting back to my roots, which were completely unfulfilled. Right. So Free Fly was kind of a natural outgrowth. I met a couple of people who suggested that I organize a group because they knew I was dabbling in improvisation. So things just fell into place, organized the group, and it had some success. So you've had a very extensive career. You've done studio work, you've taught, you've done solo performances, you have free flight, and I know you've published some of your own music and you've recorded your own music, and I'm sure there's tons of other things I don't even know, but what is, out of all those things, what's your favorite career path that you've taken? Well, the thing that I always have the most fun with is playing a jazz concert. Yeah. Uh, in free flight especially because it's it's just a home base for me. Uh, either playing with Mike Garson or Brian Pezzoni, who are the two pianists I've worked with for the last 30 years. There's just a kind of a musical brotherhood with both of those guys that I'm able to do things in a much freer mentality, with a much freer mentality. I'm able to, to play music that not a lot of people are able to do, and that's that feels kind of cool. Yeah. And I just, uh, just in terms of a pure joy, that probably is the most fun thing. It is by far not the most lucrative thing, right. but generally a lot of the most fun things are not necessarily the big money makers. Out of all the performances you've ever done, if you can remember all of them, do you have a favorite moment that you just really enjoy playing, like whether it's the hall or the group or the performance itself? Well, yeah, to basically take a left turn on you, I'll never forget a Pittsburgh Symphony re uh, performance in Carnegie Hall of Mahler's Das Lied von der Herde. And that probably would have been in 1973 or 1974, where almost everyone in the orchestra was crying. I mean, it oh, wow. was unbelievable. Wow. So just to be, you know, playing fourth flute in that was really, that, that really was a re remarkable concert. Right. Um, I remember not the specific concert, but I remember playing a Beethoven third with Giulini in the LA Philharmonic. That was an amazing event. The, th the thing about <clears throat> being in a, a major high level orchestra is that sometimes, not a lot, sometimes 105 people are so much on the same page that it takes the whole experience to an amazingly higher level. And those were really astounding experiences. I can remember in free flight, some really, really fun, amazing evenings, but those would be like even a two hour concert or maybe, you know, three sets in a nightclub where it was like, wow, what a, what a great night this was. Mm -hmm. But those, they, they kind of all blur into, you know, maybe 20 or 30 concerts over the years. But I do remember those, those concerts. And, and it, I can remember, you know, I would say that the remarkable thing for me has been to be in those great orchestras with some amazing conductors, you know, playing symphonic uh, suite from West Side Story with Leonard Bernstein wow. was, and recording it, it was just unforgettable. It was a few years before he died. Wow, that's crazy. Right? So, you know, those are pretty, pretty big highlights for me. Do you have a favorite piece of music? or a favorite composer? I would say uh, probably my all-time favorite piece is The Rite of Spring. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just to be in the middle of that, hoping, wishing that you could play timpani, but still, you know, playing the alto flute. Right. When the orchestra makes, I mean, even a, a, even a mediocre performance of that piece is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. But when all, when everybody's locked in, there's nothing quite like that. Right. So that that would be my favorite orchestral piece. Uh, in terms of jazz, probably, you know, I could I could say there are a bunch of songs that I love to try to play, but, uh, you know, a monumental work like that, I mean, if there ever is anything like art, that's art. And when you're in the middle of it, it's pretty... Uh, Incomparable. You have the best of the best of students coming to you that want to study with you both at USC and Colburn, and you have so many applicants. So how do you decide 
who you want to take at those schools? It's a, a formula that changes every year. Uh, and basically it's an unscripted formula. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for the, for the big talents. Uh, I also, most of the time, the students that I'm auditioning, I've had some contact with them, either a private lesson or I've met them in a master class. So it's not just a cold meeting the, when right. they walk in for their eight minute audition. Mm -hmm. I will say that over my teaching career, which is uh, 35 or 40 years, there have been maybe 10 or 15 students that I knew nothing about showed up at an audition and just blew me away. Wow. Most of the people I have a hint that this is really, this is someone I, I think that we would work well together. A lot of it has to do with that. You, you, never, you never can be sure what the chemistry is going to be between you and a student. It's, it's up to you to give your best as a teacher, to give your best to make that dynamic work. But sometimes you can do your best and it just, it, it's not really hitting on all cylinders. I haven't had too many losses in that department, but there have been a couple of students that clearly I wasn't the right guy at that time for them. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's been pretty good. So when I'm screening, when I'm thinking about that, thinking about choosing someone for one position, it's a little bit of rolling the dice, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm really looking for always a personal sound for someone who thinks way beyond the accuracy of the notes, that the accuracy is there. Technical proficiency is important, but I'm always looking for a special sound and an interesting personality, someone that I think I can maybe stimulate to go to a higher level. Uh, the hard part is that there are always, you know, 80% of the people who audition for you who don't make it are really good players, right. really good players. And you just, you have to know they're going to end up in a good situation. And maybe I might end up working with them later on right. in a master's program or even a doctorate. Mm -hmm. But it's tough. It's, it's the hardest. It's really the hardest part of the job. It's an incredibly enjoyable part, but it's really stressful from the standpoint you'll hear someone play and you know they're basically in the second tier of the group of people you're hearing. They have so much going and you would love to work with them, but uh, only so many hours in a day and only so many students are allowed at each school. Right. What advice would you give to flutists and musicians in general that have just graduated from college and are trying to start their career? Well, hopefully your undergraduate and masters if you've done postgrad, hopefully you've been in a situation where you were alert enough to network, where you were alert enough to take advantage of all that the school offered, not just the flute studio, not just the concert band, wind ensemble, or the orchestra, right. but that you really were career building from the time you were 18 or 19. So that then when you get out, you have to know that unless you win a job, which could happen, but the odds are not good, Unless you win a job, you're probably going to be doing some sort of freelance work in some city for a while right. until things work out. So I would say this to an undergraduate, someone who's just starting, don't make any enemies. The network is really going to be important. You don't have to love everybody you work with, but it's really important that everyone look at you as someone they would enjoy having in a section. Practice harder than anyone else if you get a chance. Mm -hmm. If you have the opportunity to do some private teaching along the way, it's really, really critical. I don't know that in today's times anyone can have a successful life as a musician without a component of teaching. Right. Um, other things are if, if your specific love is the orchestral repertoire and wanting an orchestral job, then you need to be doing that so hardcore. You need to be doing your best to get into the summer institutes where there is some sort of orchestral program. Mm -hmm. You need to be an absolute ace on the excerpts, but way beyond the excerpts, you need to be planting yourself in the middle of the orchestral repertoire 
to see if in fact you can stand it. Mm -hmm. Some people have won jobs who didn't actually love the orchestral literature, but they were good enough to win a job. Right. And it doesn't tend to work out. To switch gears a little bit, I want to talk with you about your session work that you did on, on movies. Mm -hmm. Do you have an embarrassing moment? I can share two of them. Okay, awesome. <laughs> One of them was really, it was hilarious. Um, whenever The Color Purple was being produced, uh, I was in the orchestra that was doing that. I believe there was a section of four flute players I think it was uh, Luis de Tullio, Sheridan Stokes, myself, and probably David Shostak. And on one of the sessions, I think it was maybe one of the final sessions for the movie, it was a big, big deal. Quincy Jones was the composer, but there were five or six other guy, composers who worked with him. And it was such a big deal, this movie, that CBS 60 Minutes did a special on it. Wow. And in fact, on this day, they were in the studio. This is at MGM um, over in Culver City. And the particular cue that they were recording uh, called for two recorder players. And Sheridan Stokes and I were playing recorders. And uh, not only were we playing recorders, we were not sitting in the flute section. We were actually standing together, kind of isolated with our two music stands. And they're rolling the tape. I mean, basically the cameras were going the whole time. In fact, I never saw the CBS broadcast to know if this got on the tape or not. But when we started playing the piece, da -da 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 -da, Sheridan and I come in and all you hear from me is, <laughs> well, I had placed my hands because I don't play a lot of recorder, one hole down oh, no. so that every, so that my, lead hole was actually on the B key oh, no. on the A key and it was really hilarious I couldn't I didn't know what was happening and I thought, oh my god it's me <laughs> so that was fairly embarrassing and the other one is kind of a it's just a funny little incident I have no idea what movie this was but this was at the 20th Century Fox it might even been a television soundtrack I'm not sure but let's say whatever and uh, we played a cue, and 10 seconds into the cue, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, my stomach let out a growl oh, no. that was so loud that they had to stop the tape. <laughs> so that was a little embarrassing. So anyone who's doing session work should always have like a granola bar or something. Whatever you can do. <laughs> I, I have to say this, I've had a few students who under pressure, when they breathe, they actually get a stomach gurgle. Wow. That is something that would not work in the studios. Yeah. So. So work on that. Yeah. Right? How many different films do you think you've worked on? Do you know? You know, I, I think it's around 700. 700. That's a lot. It's a bunch. Uh, I think so. That's, that's what, that's what my residual sheet says. So did you go and see a lot of movies that you played on or at a point had you done so many that you just didn't? You know what the anymore? kind of the bizarre thing is, is I'm really not a movie guy at oh, all. Okay. I'm so hyper antsy that sitting in a movie is really what I rarely do because mm -hmm. I'll go straight to sleep. Oh. Generally I'm burning so hard during the day that anytime I sit to watch a television show <laughs> or you know something like a movie, I don't last through it. I've actually been better the last couple of years, but I, I really have not seen too many of the movies that I've done. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of big ones that I did that I still need to watch. I, Memoirs of the Geisha, I had a lot to do on that one. I haven't seen that. I even own the DVD. I just haven't watched right. it. Uh, Toy Story 3, I had some really nice stuff. I haven't watched that one yet. I, so that's mm -hmm. these are on my to-do list. In, you know, a lot of these movies, they've, been, they've become iconic. And do you know when you're recording them that it's going to be something that's going to be famous and everyone's going to know the tune? Or can you tell in the session? I can't. You can tell when there's an incredible melody that you're playing. That, boy, that's a beautiful melody that deserves to live. Right. Uh, but... I think it's it's the same as like a, a pop producer looking for the hit, looking for the hook, 
looking for that melody that's going to grab people. Right. It's really, really hard to, to mm -hmm. determine that. I mean, I'm guessing that there have been a million themes that people thought were really going to be that next big one. Right. And maybe, you know, 15 of them actually became that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you just don't know it. For example, uh, you know, people of my generation certainly know the television show All in the Family. And the theme song to All in the Family was written by Roger Kellaway. It basically provided him with a, a living for the rest of his life. He was in a position to submit that. I think he might have been the composer for the soundtrack in the early days when they did that. He told me he wrote it in five minutes. Wow. Bum, ba -dum, ba -da, da -da. There it was. And there it was. And he probably would love to have written 15 more. Right. But you just never know how mm -hmm. those things are going to work. So, wow. and, and I'm I'm not really good at that. You know, in the, in the free flight years, uh, in the 80s, we had some recording contracts with CBS Records. And, of course, they wanted to sell records. And the way you sell records is to get your music on the radio. Right. And uh, we were totally on board with that. And basically we were getting, I guess, justifiable pressure of them. You know, you guys, you need to, to, to come up with something that could be a hit, something that's like a catch, a, you know, that memorable kind of tune. And we actually, we were willing to make an effort at that. I think our third recording was when, when we did a version of Norwegian Wood by the Beatles. And that actually got a lot of airplay. It was one of the things we played on The Tonight Show one time. Johnny mm -hmm. Carson loved it. Awesome. But it, it didn't translate into some kind of bonanza success. Right. So, you know, identifying a, a really uh, a snappy, catchy tune, you, you had no idea if it's going to hit. Right. I wish I did. <laughs> Just to wrap things up, I'm gonna do a flash round, which I explained a little bit earlier. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a name of one of the movies that you played on, and you tell me like the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Anything, whatever it is. Okay. okay. Ready? Okay. Robocop. Very fast. Alien Three. Weird. E. T. Exhilarating. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Action. <laughs> Forrest Gump. Sweet. Back to the Future. Crazy. Princess Diaries. Do you remember that one? Yes, I love Princess Diaries. Uh, nice. Jurassic Park. Difficult. Okay, and last but not least, Anchorman. I can't do one word on this one. Okay. Because I played on Anchorman, but I didn't play the jazz flute. Okay. So the word is disappointment. Disappointment. Oh, no. <laughs> does, does everyone ask you about that? Everyone. Yeah. And I, because I did play on it, I played on the background music, mm -hmm. but uh, Kutis Buckingham is the guy who played the jazz okay. flute solos. And that happened in a complete, you know, when we did our part, we had no idea that there was any jazz for right. going on at all. That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much again for doing this interview. My pleasure. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe to my channel because I put out new videos every Thursday. You can also follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you should also check out some of the other videos I've done right up here.